Hello, I'm Special Special Agent Efren Chavez. I'm from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Office of Law Enforcement. I'm located in Chandler, Arizona, and today I will be presenting uh, uh, some of the just a basic overview of some of the law enforcement regulations that you might see on your everyday lives. I really truly apologize for not being able to be there. Something came up. It's an emergency. That's kind of the nature of this job. Just get called out all of a sudden. But I will try to be there next time for another presentation. Or if you guys have any questions or any concerns, please don't hesitate to contact me. So the three laws that we're going to stick to during this presentation are the uh, Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which does have a li strict liability statute, the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, which provides protection for bald and golden eagles, duh, and the Endangered Species Act, which protects bird species listed under that act. So I'm going to be focusing a lot on birds, but I do know that you guys might encounter some other animals, you know, for example, bats, mammals, and other different types of animals during your everyday activities. So, but this, this presentation is mostly going to be about birds because I figured those are the animals that you're mostly going to encounter in your everyday work. So the first law that we're gonna look into is the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of uh, 1918 and you can find this law in 16 USC 703 to 712. I know this law uh, it must it does have like a lot of words so bear with me uh, there's a lot of words but let's go over them together so it shall be unlawful at any time by any means or in any manner to pursue hunt take kill capture attempt to take capture or kill possess offer for sale sale, offer to barter, barter, offer to purchase, purchase, deliver for shipment, ship, export, import, cost to be shipped, exported or imported, deliver for transportation, transport or cost to be transported, carry or cost to be carried, or receive for shipment, transportation, carriage or export any migratory bird. And this is what also makes the Migratory Bird Treaty Act so inclusive. Any part, nest, or eggs of any such bird or any product, whether or not manufactured, which consists or is composed in whole or part of any such bird or in any part, nest, or egg thereof. So it's a pretty uh, inclusive law that incorporates any bird, any part, nest, or eggs of any such bird, or any product of that particular bird. So these are the basics of the law. So in 1800s, this is a little history for you guys. In 1800s, there was like zero regulations on uh, in the marketplace when it came to wildlife laws. So market hunters just went crazy. They started killing birds left and right without any disregard, with any, without any regard for the birds. Mostly they were for these adorn, adorn, ornamental feathers for hats. So you could see how extravagant the ladies were in the bottom left hand corner. Uh, the birds, I mean, you can have like from a bunch of feathers to sometimes the whole head of the bird with the beak and everything. So nowadays, I don't know how that would uh, look in, in modern day fashion, but that was uh, the law back in the day. Where, that was the, the fashion back in the day. Everybody wore these ridiculous hats with all these feathers and, and bird parts on them. So this led to the extinction, especially the Labrador ducks and the great hawks uh, in that area, in that era. And then soon it also led uh, to the extinction of the passenger pigeons, the Carolina parakeets and the heath hens. 
In 1900, uh, the Congress passed the Lacey Act, which is the first federal law to protect wildlife. And this, this law was aimed for these market hunters that would just go and blast birds out of the sky. Um, and uh, they would poach them and then travel, travel with them across state lines. So this gave us a little bit of grip on these market hunters and these poachers uh, doing all these illegal activities. Uh, it is fun to say that this law it also is, um, is in, in play to this day. And we use this law in a lot of our, um, in a lot of our cases. Uh, and the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was enacted in 1918. And this was made to combat overhunting and poaching of, uh, of birds for this demand uh, for feathers for women's hats. So this uh, treaty was first made by the U.S. and England in behalf of Canada and then other other countries started joining in so these court the courts have continuously upheld the strict liability status of this of this law which is that the proof of intent is not required our criminal cases can vary from uh, misdemeanor or uh, felony cases so these are kind of a little bit of pictures you know i, I don't want to kind of bog you down with a whole bunch of words so the first two pictures uh, up and down uh, are the market hunters. So you can see the vast amount of birds that they would shoot out of the sky for this feather trade. It's just unimaginable the amount of birds that were hunted back in the day without any regard for the conservation of the species. In the bottom, you see these guns that uh, would be mounted on these kayaks and with these with these guns they would just blast birds out of the sky in the hundreds so these laws were mainly made to combat these types of activities the middle two pictures are the passenger pigeon so as you can see the passenger pigeon was very the the populations of the passenger pigeon were very numerous back in the day so you can see all these pigeons like everywhere and people just started blasting blasting them out of the sky left and right and it, this led to the overall extinction of the passenger pigeon which is on the bottom of that middle middle column middle column uh the last two are the uh, labrador duck and the carolina parakeet which are extinct because of all these activities and the non-regulation of the of wildlife laws. So what does take mean? So take as defined on 50 CFR 10.12, you can find all of these different types of laws in uh, ecfr.gov and I put a link at the end of this presentation if you want to verify all the information that I gave you uh, you can check it out for yourself and you can see all these definitions and all these laws and if you have any questions I mean please contact me and if I can answer your questions I'll get somebody to be able to answer your questions so the uh, take as defined for this particular law is pursue hunt shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, or collect. So what is prohibited under the MBTA and what's not prohibited under the MTA? So what's prohibited, as we stated in the past slide, is take, pursue, hunt, possess, purchase, sell, barter, transport, import, or export. Now, this is important because what's not prohibited is harass or disturb. In some of the other laws that we'll see, uh, harass and disturb are prohibited, but in this particular law, uh, in MBTA, they're not prohibited. Uh, it is not prohibited to give a bird to somebody else, receive it as a gift, or uh, destroy an empty nest. So, also the destruction of empty nests is important because in our everyday activity as arborists, 
you will see uh, people destroying empty nests, and we get a lot of calls for um, from people saying that you know um, arborists or uh, labor workers or, or landscapers or what have you uh, have destroyed empty nests, and uh, and this is allowed with the MBTA, but we got to make sure that they're that they're. So what is a migratory bird? So a migratory bird is any bird whatsoever that is listed in 50 CFR 1013. And the list is pretty extensive and it's important that we become familiar with these li with this list because uh, it tells us which birds are protected and which birds are not. So what bird, uh, also the mutation or hybrid of any such species, including any part nest or eggs thereof are also protected under this law. What birds are not protected? Uh, the upland game birds or exotics are not protected. As you can see three protected birds right here, the um, red-tailed hawk, the Swainson's hawk, and the American kestrel. So active nest, what is an active nest? So an active nest is one that contains viable eggs and or chicks. A nest becomes active when the first egg is laid and remains inactive until fledged young are no longer dependent on the nest. So in certain birds, the, the, when the, the birds fledge and that's it, but certain birds the uh, birds still stay depending a little dependent on the nest for a little bit of time before they actually are are leave the nest and don't require the nest anymore. So we got to know a little bit of what the bird activity is to determine if the act the bird the nest is active or not. So permitted take this permitted take um, intentional take is only allowed by permit with a permit. So permits are required to possess any part, nest, or bird. There's 12 types of permits available. The most common are depredation permits, scientific collecting permits, banding permit. There's other types of permits like falconry permits, rehabilitation permits, and religious permits. Now you can find all the different types of permits in the website that I'm going to uh, provide at the end of this presentation and how to apply for them and what information you need to um, to get one of those permits. Uh, if you have any questions, I mean, please don't hesitate to give me a call or to contact me through email. Um, now, big question that we get is the M opinion. So the M opinion concludes that the take of birds resulting from an activity is not prohibited by the MBTA when the underlying purpose of that activity is not to take birds. So if you do something that you purposely are going to take birds, then that's legal on, under the MBTA uh, regulation. But if you're going to do something and your overall purpose is not to take birds, but you take a bird, then um, it is not prohibited under the MBTA. Now, recently there was a big case out of New York that um, overturned the M opinion uh, and upheld the strict liability clause for the MBTA uh, take policy. And this was a big win for the conservation effort uh, in the US, especially for migratory birds. But we really can't determine how this is gonna affect the cases in the long run. So as of now, we're still going uh, through with the M opinion unless told otherwise. Um, but don't hesitate to call us if you see any type of violation of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act because we can still investigate it, we can still record it, and we can still do a lot about it. But a lot of these different uh, clauses and, and uh, opinions can also hinder the prosecution of some of these cases. But if we can document it and educate them, and train the different people that might violate some of these laws, it, all, it is also a win for us. So please also contact us regarding any type of Migratory Bird Treaty Act violation.
Next, we're going to go and see the uh, Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. Now, I thought to add this law into this presentation because many of you might be, come across a bald or golden eagle. So it's important to know what uh, law protects them um, since they're not listed under the ESA anymore. So this law prohibits anyone from take, possession, sale, purchase, barter, offer to sell, purchase, or barter, transport, export, or import of any bald or golden eagle alive or dead, including any parts, nests, or eggs, unless allowed by permits. So in the permits, you can see them in this uh, 16 U.S.C. 668A and uh, 50 CFR 22. So this protection includes inactive nests as well as active nests. Now there are some uh, exemptions to this, but uh, for the most part, inactive nests as well as active nests are protected. So permits are available for both intentional and incidental take. So regulations for taking these eagles are listed under 50 CFR 22. So take definition under uh, BAGEPA. So unlike MBTA, the BAGEPA specifically designs the term take to include pursue, shoot, shoot at, poison, wound, kill, capture, trap, collect, molest, or disturb. So even if you molest or, dis or disturb these uh, beautiful creatures, you can get prosecuted under the uh, BAGEPA. Uh, you can see these in 16 U.S.C. 668C. So disturb means to agitate or bother a bald or golden eagle to a degree that causes or is likely to cause based on the science, best scientific information available. Injury to an eagle, a decrease in its productivity by substantially interfering with normal breeding, feeding, or sheltering behavior, or nest abandonment by substantially interfering with normal breeding, feeding, or sheltering behavior. Big problem that we have is these planes flying really close to, the, to some active nests and uh, disturbing these particular birds and their behavior. So the Endangered Species Act. I also thought to include some of this because uh, you might come across some uh, animals that are also uh, listed under this act. So the definitions are conservation to use all methods necessary to bring species to the point at which the ESA is no longer a bit, uh, necessary. So we have seen some of these success stories uh, when it comes to its ESA. Uh, more notably, the, uh, the alligator, the American alligator was listed under ESA at one time and is now no longer listed. Uh, also, the, the wolf uh, was also listed under the ESA and uh, is no longer listed anymore. So some of these conservation strategies are working and uh, some of these laws are working so that we um, have unlist to the point where we've unlisted these animals. So endangered species are species in danger of extinction throughout all or a significant portion of its range. Threatened species are species likely to become endangered in the foreseeable future. These two um, birds on these pictures are endangered, the whooping crane and the California condor, uh, which you might come across. Endangered Species Act, you can find it in 16 U.S.C. 1531 to 1541. So take is defined under that uh, 16 U.S.C. 1532, which includes harass. Harass is defined in 50 CFR 17.3, and the list of all these threatened and endangered species are in 50 CFR 1711 for animals and 50 CFR 1712 for plants. This is my contact information. Uh, feel free to uh, email me or call me. Uh, also, I put the, um, the website to the permits. Uh, you can find all the different permits for all the laws that we talked about. There is also for an endangered species uh, permit, you need to apply by region. So I put the website for the regions on there and how to contact them. 
the uh, CFRs can be uh, located in that particular website, ECFR. And if you want to see the US code, uh, you can also see it at that particular website. Thank you so much for allowing me to present for you guys. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much. Uh, we have um, Special Agent Chavez here to talk to us a little bit about, you know, enforcement of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, what's important to know in, um, he's stationed in Arizona. Um, so I'd like to, to introduce him at this point. Special Agent Chavez, you want to tell us a little bit more about your, your job and your role uh, for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service? Uh, yes, so, um, so I'm a Special Agent Chavez here in uh, Chandler, Arizona. And um, before, you know, I start kind of uh, introducing myself, just kind of want to give you like a quick rundown of what I've done. Um, I was a school teacher um, way back in the day. <laughs> so uh, I was a school teacher. I used to teach biology, chemistry, physics. Um, and then I was a, uh, I went on to uh, customs, U.S. Customs Service, uh, Customs and Border Patrol. Um, and I was an agriculture specialist there for like three or four years. Um, and the agriculture specialist, we mainly dealt with uh, invasive pests going in and out of the country uh, in agricultural products, but we also assisted with all the other agencies. So, you know, I have experience regulating uh, fish and wildlife things, um, uh, CDC, um, FDA. Uh, so we pretty much handle anything that wasn't uh, drugs and people. <laughs> so, and uh, from there, I went to the US, Cust uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, as an inspector. And we dealt with imports and exports of wildlife, uh, hunting trophies, live animals, um, you know, products made of wildlife uh, going in and out of the country. Uh, you name it, we did it. Uh, we, we imported and exported uh, tigers, elephants, monkeys, um, you know, feather hats, uh, you know, Louis Vuitton uh, things, you know, anything leather, uh, high-end items like Rolexes and things like that. Then I uh, became a special agent with U.S. Fish and Wildlife out of Arizona. And here uh, we handle anything that is uh, uh, national and international. So our main focus is to uh, break down um, international groups of uh, wildlife traffickers. That's mainly our uh, main, main goal here in, uh, in the country as U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So, Anything international, um, that's mainly our, our main goal. And we're trying to break down these groups uh, that are poaching wildlife and, uh, and, um, and selling it or trafficking it or, uh, you know, exporting it or importing um, different wildlife. Um, here in Arizona, I mean, you get a little bit of everything. So... We get a lot of birds, a lot of bird strikes, a lot of um, uh, hunting um, of birds or of, uh, you know, mammals. We have bear, we have mountain lion, we have um, uh, coyotes, we have uh, Mexican gray wolves, which are super endangered. Um, we have uh, the... Um, we have a lot of uh, import and export uh, off, off of our southern border, a lot of import export stuff, CITES, um, things. We have a lot of uh, hunting within the reservations out here. Uh, that is a problem. Also a lot of uh, eagle, um, bald and golden eagle uh, cases with uh, reservations. So, I mean, we get a, lot, a little bit of, of everything uh, we have a big international airport as well, so we get a lot of imports and exports there. Um, but mainly that's that's uh, what we do um, here in Arizona. But we can handle cases all over the country. And I want you guys, the main idea for me coming on here is, you know, to get more eyes out in the field, make sure that you guys are uh, communicating uh, with me or whoever you're uh, agent there is in your area 
Um, so you can communicate what's going on if you see something that's wrong or, or you feel that something's going on that's not right. Uh, please let us know or if you have a question about something, should I do something like this or like that? Um, we want to know. Um, so that's pretty much it with uh, in regards to, to uh, what we do here in Arizona. Great. So yeah, we certainly understand that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service deals with a variety of laws and a variety of situations that are pretty different than uh, maybe what we're focused in the tree care industry, such as CITES being sort of import-export of, of wild animals and things like that. What can you tell us about uh, the M opinion, um, you know, the current status? What is uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service doing right now about that? What, what have you been seeing? Um, and I'll just point out, I have not gotten any questions yet in the Q&A over here, people. So uh, this is going to be a very short session unless people start asking questions. So please, please jump in there. But, uh, but Special so, Agent Chavez, what, what are you seeing with the M opinion? So the M opinion, I mean, like you stated, unless uh, companies were really out to get birds, um, that was their sole um, reason for reasoning for um, getting birds. That's really um, what gave us the uh, that limitation. So pretty much is if a company is really out to get like a bird or its nest, that's when we can prosecute. Now to this day, we're still uh, under that notion. That's that's the guidance that we've gotten. I know there's this uh, recent uh, ruling that just came out. Uh, not too long ago, where a judge upheld the strict liability, strict liability of the uh, MBTA, Migratory Bird Treaty Act, um, and that was a big win for birds all over the country, uh, and for the Migratory Bird Treaty Act because if you if you go through it, it's a pretty strong law. Um, that strict liability, I mean, you can't even possess or keep or or kill, or you know, a bird, or or its nest, or parts of, um, that's that makes it pretty easy for us to prosecute. But this M opinion kind of gave us, um, you know, we're fighting with one hand tied behind our back, where we have to prove that their sole purpose was to go and kill the birds. So this was a big is a is is a big problem for us because we feel like we should be. Uh, prosecuting a lot more cases uh, under this law, but I mean we have to go with what we got. And uh, but there's, like I said in my presentation, there's other ways to skin a cat. You know, there. Uh, so just because we have this ruling doesn't mean that that you guys shouldn't go out and, and talk to your special agents or talk to your law enforcement about these um, these problems that are going on in your community, especially. Uh, in the tree care, uh, in the tree care um, yeah, field, uh, because there's there's more ways to to come across. There's more laws. There's more regulations. There's state. There's federal. Um, so we have a, a wide range of different things that we can prosecute on. This is not the only law, and if if we do prosecute under this law, um, we can. Uh, you know, maybe find our ways around it, or if anything, document so that um, if and when this M opinion goes away, if it ever goes away, um, we can uh, keep prosecuting and prove the knowledge that these people are doing something wrong. Now, this ruling that just came out, uh, it is a very interesting ruling. Like I said, it's a big win, but we're really not going to know what's going to happen with this ruling until more cases are brought up to the Department of Justice, and we can we can uh, verify that more of these judges are making these types of rulings. Um, we can't really say what's going to happen because you know a lot of cases haven't been brought up, but it makes me excited of. You know more cases to come that's just going to strengthen this opinion and maybe just do it do it away altogether okay so it sounds like the u.s fish and wildlife service at least in your area is continuing to operate with the m 
um, M opinion, but you're certainly aware of, you know, these other things happening and maybe, um, maybe that'll change in the future. Obviously, none of us can really predict what's, what's going to happen in the future. So I, I think that's really interesting and also really great to point out that there's other laws, you know, Endangered Species Act, California has lots of laws, Hawaii has several, several of its own laws. So depending on what area you in, you're in, um, there may be other laws that are applicable, as well as a variety of other reasons to act responsibly around wildlife. So, um, Greg, we, ha we have a question co coming in here, um, specific to Arizona. So okay. how does the Federal uh, Fish and Wildlife Service work with the Arizona Department of Game and, Game and Fish, I think they're called? Will the Arizona yep. State Wildlife Managers, or Game Wardens, enforce the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, or does it have to be a federal officer? Do they help you with those investigations? How does that work? So that's a very interesting question. Uh, I appreciate you guys um, making questions. Um, so yeah, we do work very closely with Arizona Game and Fish uh, and the wildlife managers out in, in this particular area. Most agents, I mean, if you count the number of agents out in the country, um, in U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I mean, I think there's less than, than even like 200 out in, in, there's, yeah, there's less than 200 agents out in, um, in special in, in U.S. Fish and Wildlife, so we heavily depend on uh, game wardens in a, every every state um, to prosecute a lot of our cases or to get information about um, violators out in the country. And uh, they do enforce Migratory Bird Treaty Act, but under their own regulation uh, as a state. Now, if there's some infraction or some sort of uh, a violation that they cannot uh, prosecute, then they'll call us. Or if there's something that we have a better grasp on, um, then they'll call us to uh, go and prosecute. Let me give you an example. So for um, this past weekend was opening day for uh, white wing dove season, well, dove season. It was was uh, was dove season opening weekend. Um, the opening day is on the first, but the weekend was this past weekend. So we worked that out. We worked it, and doves are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. But there was a lot of uh, um, uh, game wardens out also patrolling, so they can give their own tickets out. We can give our own tickets out, um, and. Um, and we work together, mainly uh, work together. But for example, there's a lot of times that people do a lot of uh, uh, baiting of dove. So they'll go out into a field and throw corn or grain or whatever. And it, baiting becomes a little bit more complicated. So a lot of state guys will call us to go and check out to see if we have a baiting situation uh, in the field, and we'll investigate it and prosecute it and all that because there's a lot of laws to baiting, uh, you know, especially if it falls under the normal farm practice of that particular state. So we as federal agents need to work with also the, uh, the farming experts in that particular state to figure out if it's something that's normal to farming in that particular area so we can prosecute a bait or no bait. Uh, so it becomes a little bit more complicated. So the Arizona Game Fish guys will normally call us uh, if there's a situation like that. But mostly, uh, we work very closely together to be able to prosecute. And we, as uh, federal game wardens, uh, we couldn't really do our job uh, if we didn't have Arizona Game Fish. Uh, that's interesting. I yeah, it sounds like you you guys work closely together and. Uh, to have have different types of laws that you can sort of pass pass jobs back and forth. I think I think that's interesting. Um, we have another another question. From, yeah, uh, did you have something to say, or should I ask another question? Yeah, I know. Just to reiterate, also there's another law called the Lacey Act. I don't know if you guys have heard about it, but the Lacey Act works with a state, tribal, or uh, international law. 
Uh, so we work a lot with the guys from, from Arizona Dean Fish, as well as the reservations have their own wildlife officers as well. And using their own laws compare, uh, combined with a uh, transport or an interstate transport or something like that, um, then we can also uh, prosecute uh, the Lacey Act as well. So we work closely uh, with them. Sorry, man. Uh, we can go on to the next question. Yeah, no, no, this is this is great information. I appreciate that. Um, so the next question is, there's likely many instances throughout Arizona where the Migratory Bird Treaty Act is being um, violated. How do you prioritize enforcement? How to who gets prosecuted and who doesn't? How, how do you guys how do you how do you approach that? Do you have any insight for us? So yeah, that's a very good question. Like, um, so a lot of times uh, we prioritize enforcement through a uh, through like a, a, depending on the species. Um, so it's an endangered species or a migratory bird species or a uh, CITES species. Uh, CITES is the uh, Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, um, which is an international treaty. So we handle it if it's an endangered or threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Of course, uh, has to do with a lot of um, has to do has a heavier weight of its endangered species versus a threatened or versus a species that's not listed on there. Migratory bird um, will handle it. Uh, what has a bigger impact? on that particular species, we'll put, prioritize it higher or lower on the um, on that spectrum. Or if it's a commercial activity uh, that's killing um, migratory birds or poisoning, uh, will also be handled a little bit quicker than some something else. Uh, sightings as well, depending on it's a, a sighting one species or sightings two or sightings three. Uh, Citing one would be uh, the more prioritized, uh, but there's also a lot of education involved. So a big chunk of our job is to educate people, not only you guys or um, other societies or, or other firms or other things, uh, but also educate the public and call them and tell them, hey, um, you can't do this or you can do this or whatever, don't do it again because you've already been educated on this particular topic. So a big part of our job is uh, education. Um, not everything is solved with a ticket or a violation or a prosecution, but a lot of it is solved through education and um, working with these agencies or these particular people, individuals, uh, to come up with a solution um, to better serve the species. And if uh, they continue doing it, then we can definitely uh, follow through with um, a more stringent uh, violation, um, either prosecution or a uh, violation notice. Or, yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we really appreciate you coming and joining us today and doing some of that, that education uh, that you were just talking about. Can you tell us some more about other types of education that you're out there doing related to Migratory Bird Treaty Act, maybe something that's uh, helpful to the tree care industry or um, certifications or resources that are out there. Do you have any any good insight for us? So something that I've been talking to uh, Liberty Wildlife is um, I was telling them uh, to come up with some sort of, well, I was like suggesting, they were uh, had an idea about a program to to educate uh, landscapers and uh, tree trimmers that are out in the community. That's a big problem uh, here in, in the Arizona area um, where tree trimmers or landscapers go out there. And I understand they just have a job to do and, uh, and they have a, uh, something that they need to do right away. And they, they really don't have the uh, saving the species as their highest priority, especially uh, migratory birds. Um, so 
they suggested maybe coming up with some sort of uh, education program to sort of um, program where they could be educated, you know, to use better majors to conserve species or maybe to wait um, until the, you know, a bird is fledged in order to do whatever job they need to do in order to conserve species. Uh, I suggested maybe getting some sort of certification where they can use it on the propaganda to be able to uh, promote themselves as uh, conservationists uh, and be more of part of the solution instead of being more of a problem. Um, so I thought uh, that was a good idea. Um, yeah, I love, I love that. And that, that's really, you know, what we're trying to do here right now, right, of hopefully uh, some arborists in Arizona got some some great information from our program, from your presentation, from from other places, and I believe that the that Arizona is looking at a at a wildlife certification for for arborists. I've heard talks of it in the Pacific Northwest and other places as well. So uh, definitely interested in in reaching out to to you and Liberty Wildlife about seeing how those programs can be put together. Any any. More, more thoughts about what that might look like or, or things that you want to make sure are in there? Uh, no, I mean, uh, we, we want to be, make, make sure that they're, they're using best practices to conserve the species, making sure that they know what, who the re rehabilitators are, who the people that can relocate the birds are, um, what to do in case they see like an injured bird, or they can, in case they see a bird in a tree, I mean, those are the kind of things, maybe know some sort of birds that are protected. Um, of course, we would like to protect all the birds, you know, but um, if they know a certain birds that are protected, maybe they can uh, act a little bit faster and not just start chopping off stuff, you know, um, or maybe be able to look up, uh, you know, certain habitats or certain areas where there are more of these protected birds and, and try to do more of a, Pre, uh, like a pre-assessment uh, before they just start chopping up stuff, uh, which I'm I know gonna, you guys. Uh, I'm going to have you easy. write the next promotional piece of, of what what's needed for for training in in Arizona and other places. No, I think I think you just highlighted all the all the ideas that we're trying to get across. So I, I really appreciate that, and uh, I th I think there's still a lot to do, obviously. Um, I, have a, yeah. I have a few questions here about violations, and this is a question I've had for a while as well. Are you aware of any, you know, tree removal violations that have um, had, you know, pretty strong enforcement, right, of, of big uh, fines or jail time or anything like that? You know, we're not so interested in, like, the, the hunting situations. You deal with a wide variety of situations, but in something that was more vegetation management, and can you share us any any stories any examples of of times when when enforcement was really quite high and 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 fines were quite steep or things like that i mean uh violations are always steep when it comes to um when it comes to like a uh, higher uh, species, uh, you know, if it comes to like uh, endangered species or uh, bald eagle and eagle species, um, if it goes into a, uh, you know, a migratory bird species as well, um, it, the, the violations are a little bit higher. Of course, the, the span of the um, violation is also important, right? Now, I can't really comment on a lot of cases because uh, a lot of them are still ongoing or, or, or in courts, right? But there's heavier fine for the heavier protected birds like uh, bald and gold eagle, uh, California condor, um, um, uh, migratory birds uh, in general, but, but any endangered species uh, or endangered species habitat or things like that usually have the higher violations or higher um, um, prosecutions, you know, that, that you can say. But, um, but yeah, I mean, when it comes to tree trimming, what you meant, were you trying to ask, like, 
like trees in general that have been cut down or mainly I, like I was birds. just, you know, no, no problem if this is, we understand this is quite sensitive information, but if you had, you know, an example, I, I hear occasionally of examples uh, from people are like, oh, there was this, you know, uh, X many thousand dollar fine for this robin's nest that was disturbed in this state. And then I try to look up that information and I can't corroborate it. So I don't want to repeat any of it. And I was just wondering if you were comfortable sharing, you know, some fi some fine amounts or something to give people an idea of how um, of, of what what happens with these types of violations. I mean, off, off the top of my head, I wouldn't know, uh, like maybe like fine amounts or anything. But I mean, some violations can get can get up there. I mean, the, um, what's good to note is that it's not about how many how much money you can charge people, right? Um, I've known of, of violators that have had their 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 um, vehicles seized. Uh, I've known violators that have had their um, uh, airplanes seen because they're flying too low to the, you know, um, they're flying too low and disturbing eagles, right? Um, I've had violators have had like assets uh, seen because of, um, you know, other, uh, other um, violations, you know, not particularly uh, MBTA species, but um, other violations like uh, Totoaba or, or Ivory, or different things like that, where they had millions of dollars, you know, uh, not really my cases, but other, other people's cases. Um, so what's important here is that, uh, especially with you guys, is that any of the money that we seize or any, uh, the more the bigger the violation or, or the bigger impact on the species, we can uh, do different types of violations. Uh, but, uh, I think the top for MBTA is 15,000. So, um, so we can charge the 15,000 and that money goes into a fund to help save the species mm -hmm. uh, in that particular state or it goes to uh, societies where um, we're, you know, we'll donate to create more habitat, or 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 um, or do more research on saving the species. So, a lot of times it's not about the price of the violation, but all that money goes into uh, a fund to help protect the species. You know, so I think that's uh, what's important. Here. Yeah, at least at least some good comes out of it. I think that, that's great. Um. When, when these violations happen, how do you normally hear about them? Is it normal, normally a member of the public saw it and they call the U.S. Fish and Life, Wildlife Service or what, what happens? So we do a lot of different things. A lot of times a member of the public calls in and gives us a, uh, a lead uh, or a member of a uh, uh, company or a you know, uh, game warden or uh, local officer, local law enforcement hears about something, you know, they uh, kick in the door and they see like, you know, three or four migratory birds that are kept as, you know, uh, painted buntings or uh, hummingbirds or different things like that, you know, and they'll call us and be like, hey man, this is some, this guy has a bunch of birds in his house, so you should check it out, you know, or they see a bad practice, uh, they'll call in because they're cutting down trees with uh, hummingbird nests in them, or, uh, or they hear about people, you know, chopping up a palm tree with three or four uh, owl, uh, barn owls. Um, sometimes we get uh, um, some, well, we go a lot and uh, drive around and also do patrols about, around certain sensitive, sensitive areas and we find our own violations or we do research online um, where we can find violations. So it's a little bit of everything. Um, okay. If one of, if, if I have a variety of questions here about contacting Fish and Wildlife Service. So if, if one of our members here 
uh, sees, uh, you know, a, a, a potentially active nest being being destroyed or impacting impacted by someone, what what should they do? What should they sort of document and do on their end? Who should they contact? How how do they start start you know uh, reporting that if they if they choose to do so? So uh, yeah, so if you see a violation, I mean, always try to do the most that you can to be able to record it or, or document it in some way, you know, take a picture um, or uh, record it with its conversation um, and then contact your uh, local uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Special Agent or uh, your local uh, inspector office and they can get a hold of us or uh, your own, um, the area that you're close to should have an ecological uh, ecological services office with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they can give us a call as well. Or if all else fails and you need to get a hold of somebody, you can't. Uh, my email is on this presentation, so you can always email me or give me a call, um, and uh, I can you know help you out or put you in the right uh, put you in the right area to where you can get some some help in your particular uh, state or, or city where you're at. But don't hesitate to call me. I, mean, I understand like sometimes we go out and, and, and we look at one or two different places and they don't answer the phone or you don't get an answer back or whatever. Um, if all else fails, give me a call or send me an email. Great. Yeah. And um, I assume that's the same for sort of non-violations. If people are looking for advice or if they think they disturbed a nest and they want you know, some help in order to act responsibly, is it still good to call those same numbers? Are there sort of other different people to contact? And how do we think about sort of geographic range in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service? What's the, what's the best thing to do? In the BMPs, we tell people to reach out to wildlife biologists because the wildlife biologists or the even the rehabbers sometimes have a lot of experience in how to do this. But do you have any any advice, at least for your area in Arizona? Definitely, that's the best place to start. Call the, the wildlife biologists in your area or call the rehabbers because they'll have the most tools um, available, especially if it's like a, uh, an emergency situation. Uh, definitely call them. Um, you know, a lot of times the agents are out you know, patrolling, allowing a place where you can get service. So it's kind of hard for us to answer sometimes, but we'll give you a call back for the most part. Um, but a lot of times the best way to start, the best place to start is calling those biologists or calling those rehabbers where they can go and rescue the, um, go and rescue the, the bird or rescue the animal before, um, before, uh, before you know, it, it dies. You know, it could be like in safe place, or it could be relocated somewhere, or you know, things like that. But if you're having a question about something, or you're not sure about uh, doing something, if it's going to be legal or not legal, uh, definitely call us first, or call ecological services, or call uh, your biologist uh, beforehand. Um, if you're not sure about something, definitely call um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service first uh, before doing that, um, especially if you're not sure. Um, and like I said, if all else fails, send an email, and I'll look up somebody to help you out. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, and um, uh, especially for you know being a, a point of contact for the the Fish and Wildlife Service. You know, offering your your email to, to all of our participants to be able to to get a hold of you. Um, I know you have some meetings coming up here in a little while that uh, we have to let you get back to to your uh, very important work. But I'll just take this time to to say thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Do you have anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up here? Uh, yeah, I mean, I really want to appreciate what you guys do out here. Um, I really want to appreciate what, what uh, steps that you're taking in order to conserve the species. And I really appreciate you guys all coming together and learning um, learning about uh, what the best practices are for your uh, field. I mean, this is amazing. 
and we can get out and educate the uh, other people uh, in your community um, with these types of things. Please go out and do it and educate on how much we can preserve the species uh, and maybe do some best practices um, on what what uh, what we can do to save uh, more species in the community. Like I said, I'm always available. If you guys have any questions, or you have any doubts or any problems, definitely give me a call. If all those fail, you can always call me. Um, be your first contact in, in, in case you have a question. And um, you know, we're a small agency, but we span all over the country, so I can put you in touch with somebody very, very fast. All right. Well, we we appreciate it so much. I'll just point out to everyone on the email on your screen. Uh, that is not a space, it is an underscore between Efren and Chavez. So um, yeah. if, you're, if you're planning on, on contacting him. Uh, so at this point, I'll just say thank you to Special Agent Chavez. Thank you to the Western Chapter, Ryan Pendleton in particular. Thank you to the Forest Service for, for funding this workshop and um, CAL FIRE and so many other groups for funding the best management practices and everything else that we do.